Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Nathan. Um, it's great to be here at the iConnections Global Alternatives Conference. Thanks for being at this. Um, this is my good friend, Rick Heitzman. He's the founder and CEO of First Mark Capital. This is one of the New York City VC OGs. <laughs> Welcome, Rick. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone from iConnection for having me. Uh, and, you know, at this point in the cycle, it's really interesting conversation to have of what we're seeing in a very different world from what you just heard about, but in venture capital and that, that, that facet of the private market. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, listen, that was a really great conversation we just listened to here. I mean, what I want to spend some time with Rick talking about, Rick is... Um, been on a, he's a co-host of a podcast that he and I do together, it's called OK Computer, and we've been talking about some of the themes over the last year and a half as some things have been kind of coming unwound in the private um, investment world a little bit, and a lot of it has to do with the fact of we're all dealing with this kind of rising rate environment and the other side of the pandemic and some of the dislocations that we saw because of that. Um, and so. We really want to start out talking about, again, you know, we're calling this panel a reckoning for poor due diligence. Rick and I had a podcast, I think it was almost a year ago, we were talking about like this kind of, the NASDAQ had just kind of topped out. People didn't know it was the top. You never know it's the top when it's the top, right? But the fact is that the Fed was saying that they're going to raise interest rates aggressively to tamp down or battle inflation. And nobody knew how long and how high they would go. And Rick's point was like, oh, baby, watch out, because there was a lot of really bad due diligence in the private sectors and the lag. So let's talk about that, the lag that you see from, and you've been doing this now over multiple cycles. What is the lag from, from public markets to private markets? And then, you know, it's that Buffett conversation or that comment about when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked sort of thing. That's exactly true. So, you know, as we've talked about on OK Computer, what we saw was, you know, even 18 months ago that uh, things were moving very fast with very light due diligence and very large checks at probably valuations that were unsustainable. And for those of us who had seen cycles, that made us very scared. You know, there, there was probably folks who were feeling uh, FOMO or fear of missing out when things were moving that quickly. Um, you know, we probably took to quote Buffett again, you know, when other people are greedy, be scared. Uh, and they felt like there was a lot of greed and that made us very scared. And we said, hey, our normal process of deep diligence, getting to know the founders, understanding our process and running a thoughtful way to invest, um, you know, is going to work. It's going to work in the long term. And therefore, uh, hopefully we could avoid some of some of these disasters. But, you know, we said that we saw that happen. And then to answer the second part of your question, um, and then even and the, as the public markets turned and the public markets turned probably in uh, October, November, December of, of 2020, uh, 2021 and being in New York, um, you know, I think the conversation might be different than being in Silicon Valley. You're, you're much closer to the, to, the, uh, to the financial markets. You have a lot of friends who are deep in the financial markets and therefore you have the ability to kind of be more market aware. And as, as we saw that, we saw a lot more fear and a lot more presence and a lot more concern over rising interest rates than what maybe some of our colleagues that we served on boards with as venture capitalists saw. Uh, and we said, hey, this is going to happen, and it's not going to be short term. This is going to be a long arc process, and we think it's going to take two to three quarters, because that's what we had seen historically for you know, the news on Wall Street to get to the boardrooms of uh, a lot of earlier stage venture capital companies. And so that lag we were going to see, and, and I think we saw that of what well, we saw a market cracking on the public side in October due, due to largely interest rate uh, speculation that you, know, you really were seeing a kind of a, a bottoming out in probably Q2 or over the summer of 2022 uh, that, that kind of re really that memo uh, filtered through the system. <laughs> On the flip side, though, you know, I, I think the private market is going to lag the public market leading us out. And you know, I think yeah. then we're going to have to turn to guys like Dan who really understand that and trying to figure out, therefore, 
where do we go from yeah, here? Yeah, and so, you know, one of the things I think is really interesting, you know, you, you've been on this, this Midas uh, list for a while here, and I, I think a lot of that is obviously predicated on doing some of that kind of, you guys are very early stage, you're seed stage, and so you were on the board of, of, of Pinterest. You were the first institutional money there. Um, you saw something about um, DraftKings. You had a path forward. It wasn't just fantasy. It was towards you know, you know, sports betting. Talk to us a little bit, again, going back to business model, and I think that's a big part of your theme as it relates to due diligence. Um, you know, Those business models were exposed after years of kind of VC, um, I guess you would call subsidizing those yes models for consumers. So let's talk a little bit about that and why were you able to look at a Pinterest or a DraftKings or a Shopify or an Airbnb yep. early on? How much did it have to do with just you know an easy money environment or versus really kind of getting to know what the business model was? And was it going to be able to kind of um, deal with a changing economic environment? I think that's a really big part of it because that's when this thing started to turn when interest rates started going up last year. So, you know, as we think about doing diligence, you know, you're not only looking at the founders and doing reference checks and background screens on them, but you're thinking holistically more about the market. And one of the things we think about is what's the end state business model of this business and do the founders understand where they need to go? And then just to contrast some of the things that you just said, Dan, if you look at Airbnb and what's the end state business model there, they're incremental, each additional dollar of revenue drives about 75% 75, 75 incremental dollars of cash flow. So they're driving meaningful, they did over a billion dollars of EBITDA in the third quarter of last year. We invested when the model was completely upside down um, and they were growing, they were investing in both the fixed costs as well as ex market expansion. But we were able to see, you know, I don't know, five, seven years ago when we first invested, hey, when this business expands, due to the nature of the marketplace, due to the capital efficiency of, of being virtual and you know, being a, a lodging company that doesn't own anything, that that's gonna be a great business model over time and will generate material earnings and cash flow. Uh, conversely, we didn't get involved in any of the quick service um, delivery companies where we said, well, all right, we understand you're investing now and you're losing a massive amount of money to give somebody uh, a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream that they could buy at the store for $5 and giving it to them for $4 to be able to do it, um, which didn't make a tremendous amount of sense to us, but we, we listened to that part of the conversation. But you know, what's your end state if you still have to go to the store, buy the ice cream, have a human being, take that ice cream, get it on a bike, drive it to someone's house, that, you know, and what does that mean for the consumer at a, you know, in order to drive a 50 plus percent margin business when you're doubling prices and what does that mean when that venture subsidy goes away and what does your business look like? Um, shockingly, even some of the founders hadn't really thought through that because it was pretty easy to raise money from people who weren't asking the questions. But what we saw was you know, the best founders are the most thoughtful about not only where their business is, but where their business is going. And you look at like a Chesky or a Nate from Airbnb, and they have been able to lay out that whole path and where exactly they were going, as opposed to folks who were dismissing diligence in, in the search for easy money that could provide the supplement. You know, it's funny when you think about some of the companies just named and some of the businesses and how they were affected over the last few years, just obviously first by the pandemic, you think about an Airbnb, we know what happened to their revenue during that, not their fault there, but if you have the wrong business model and you, yes. you know what I mean, like it's that much harder to come out of this other thing and take advantage of maybe some of the new trends um, that exist. Talk to us a little bit about like some of these founders that you invested in when they were, you know, obviously seed yeah. and pre-series A, um, and, and the period in time which they have just gone through, some of these guys became wartime generals, right? Like, yes. like, are we likely to see some of these guys, are they the next Sundar Pachais and Satya Nadellas? Are we, is there a crop that are gonna make it out of this period and end up being you know, the next CEO of a trillion dollar company in 10 years? Yeah, I think this is gonna be a crucible no different than you know, what uh, uh, Jeff Bezos faced or even Steve Jobs to a certain extent faced in other downturns, and if you could be a good peacetime general, yeah. and you were able to understand how to motivate customers, motivate employees, build a good business during the good times, and can then also 
be a good wartime general of, hey, here's how we control costs, here's how we change, a, 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 still a positive message for internal external communications, but temper that message to be sensitive to the environment. And you could do both of those things incredibly, incredibly rare. You know, we saw some founders who were great at raising money and, up, and upsides. We've seen some founders who have been ruthless cost cutters and downside, but the Venn diagram overlap is very rare. But I think that's when you see those special people who will be able to manage those businesses over several cycles into the public markets and be the exceptional people that we'll talk about like the Bezos is in yeah. 10, 20 years. What, what do you think VC has learned um, from this period? Again, so like obviously we all know, um, you know, Rick's been in the business. He's, he's been in, in multiple cycles. Um, and, and again, one of the things that I think is really unique about this cycle is that, you know, when we came out of the dot-com implosion 20 years ago, when we came out of the financial crisis, interest rates were at zero and they stayed really accommodative for a long time. Right now, we have a Fed meeting tomorrow, and Fed funds is going to go to 4.75%, the strong likelihood it's going to be 5% in March. And whatever your estimates are for when they start coming down, they're still going to be much higher than they were at the bottom of other yeah. cycles. So how do you think that in, uh, affects sort of, will we continue to see the lessons that we just talked about, poor due diligence, right? Yes. Will we see better practices among investors in the private markets on the way out over the next couple of years? I I think you're, you're already starting to see it. I mean, I think deal velocity has slowed down. You've seen an absence of people, you know, it was almost a daily event in the, in the press to say, hey, this was, you know, chair.com, we just minted a new unicorn yesterday. Uh, and so that's going away. Billion dollar valuations are going away. I, we're probably net down unicorns uh, in 2022, uh, especially if people are being honest with themselves. And then you're seeing net down $100 million rounds. And even some of the market participants who are driving that behavior are, out, are not in the business anymore. So uh, I think you're going to see a return to diligence, or I think, as we said, almost a year ago on one of the first OK Computers, yeah. the, the revenge of diligence and the return of business models as rationality and sobriety have re-entered the ecosystem. And you know, I think that's going to be important. And I think, as you say, is interest rates, everyone expects them to continue to rise, at least getting to 5%. You, know, it, you all, as, as capital allocators, are going to say, hey, I, I, I could be in a, almost in a, and be able to drive returns in a risk-free environment. What's the risk premium I'm going to need to be able to uh, invest in the riskiest part of the curve in venture capital? So I think you're going to see less capital in the market. I think you're going to see more dollars go to people who were um, thoughtful and cautious and sober during the 2021 period. And you know, we've even seen a lot of people who, have, have, who are looking for, you know, here are people who have been there in the long term. And I originally uh, got into venture capital in 98, so almost 25 years ago. Uh, and then people who will stay for this next cycle. And the ability to understand cycles um, is, we're not only seeing it from the capital providers, uh, but very interestingly, we're really starting to see it from entrepreneurs who want someone like that on their board who has seen cycles and can give really good advice both in the ups and the downs. All right, so if you're an allocator and you say to yourself, you want to kind of get more into privates, you want to yep. get more into VC, what would some of the signs be um, that this is bottoming out, that we're seeing the bottoming out of a cycle? Like, what, what, what are we, we want, you just said that net unicorns are probably going lower. Are we going to see consolidation? Are we going to see um, some major pivots of some companies that you thought were meant to do this and they were the next thing of this, yep. the next Uber of this, you know, that sort yes. of thing? What are some of the signs I think some of these people can get a sense for that we might be two quarters away from this being uh, over this, this period? Well, I, I, think, I think you're right. I think we're, we're probably back bouncing along the bottom. I think the question is going to be, how long are we going to bounce along the bottom? And I think you know, we're probably two to four quarters out. Um, you know, from a macro perspective, you know, interest rate stabilization. So as you all are thinking about, you know, how am I going to deploy my capital dollars? You know, what am I going to put in different sectors? You know, what do I, therefore, what's my view on interest rates? What's my view on a risk premium? How is that going? Um, so that's going to, I think that's going to be the macro concern from a market concern. What you're, what you're seeing, and you know, there was a big thing on secondaries, um, both 
you know, fund secondaries as, as well as individual companies that's been bouncing around the news over the last uh, month or so as you know, folks are trying to rebalance their portfolio, especially for people who have gotten way over their skis on privates, and how do you rebalance your portfolio? So you're seeing, all right, the market is starting to become more efficient. It's still jagged with a lot of volatility in the privates for all the obvious reasons, but you're seeing the market kind of reset there. Uh, you've already seen um, largely the market reset in founders' minds, and it, it took over a year for that to happen, but we're able to see a return to classic valuations after spending most of last year telling founders that uh, most of 2020 and 2021 was, was fairy tale land. That was the, any benchmarks that you have in terms of capital raising, cost of capital, and maybe even some business model things are irrelevant to the way the world has worked historically and will work. So let's go back to looking at benchmarks historically over the last 20 years and taking out that period. And that'll reset valuations, reset expectations, reset everything from cost of capital to return on capital. And we're seeing that happen in, in the primary trades. And then I, I think you're, you're seeing almost a washing out of, uh, we call them the tourists, people who um, got into venture capital or private equity or growth capital in, uh, in the 2020, 2021 period um, that were in other, some kind of other business. You know, they, they, they were in real estate, but they thought they, they, they become seed investors. They were public market investors that were kind of going earlier in the cycle because, you know, long, you know in a 12 year bull market run, they, one of the lessons people seem to learn, um, though it's not true, is the earlier you go, the more money you'll make. That's true as long as the bull market continues to go, but it doesn't go on forever. So, you know, tourists from other asset classes, tourists who haven't done that or have kind of left. And I think you're seeing some of this capitulation in the secondary market saying, <clears throat> hey, I, I was a tourist, I got burned, I'm gonna leave this asset class, return to my core focus. And you're gonna see, you know, multi-decade providers of capital and partners of entrepreneurs you know, be, you know, return to, um, you know, setting price at reasonable levels and, and having a functioning market. You know, it might take the better part of this year, but I think that, you know, we're well down the path of, of all three of those things happening. All right, let's talk about dry powder. Um, you raised two funds last year. Yes. You raised an early stage and a growth stage fund over a billion dollars. Um, talk to us how you're thinking about it. Like how much is the macro, it, when you think about deploying it, and yes. all the things that you just kind of mentioned, are the kind of inputs that, that are important to you and having the perspective of multiple cycles, how are you deploying that capital? Are you sitting on your hands a little bit? Um, you know, I, we can all, Go back to 2008, 2009, some of the most innovative companies that we interact with every day on our iPhones were all founded in and around that time. So some of the kind of multi-hundred billion dollar market caps, uh, companies yep. in, the, in the public markets, you know, they were founded or, or really hit a stride during that time. How are you thinking about, I guess, the timing of the capital raise? And it's not just first mark, there's a lot of capital that was raised at the end of 2021, early 2022, and it's waiting to be deployed um, in, in the private markets. So there is a lot of capital. You know, we, we tend not to look look around too much at what other people are doing, but really focus on, on on us. And you know, one of our premises is taking the longest view in the room. So as we think about our investments, we were an investor in Pinterest for you know 12, 13 years from seed stage to being a public company and coming off a lockup. You know, DraftKings, Airbnb, we were in seven or eight years. So you know, who knows what part of the cycle we're gonna exit in. Uh, but we can control entry price and we can control um, the mentality of how founders build the business. So uh, we raise capital. Uh, we're very fortunate to have some great LPs, probably including some people in the audience here. Uh, and so thank you. Uh, and then what, we, what we've seen is as the markets reset is that we've been able to you know, wait for our picks. And you know, we're, we're a pretty simple firm. We're, we're generally... Um, you know, small and we view ourselves as bespoke and, um, you know, looking at how, how we think about, look about at the market, especially the New York market. So each partner has to do two or three deals a year. We did a little bit less last year as entrepreneurs' expectations had to reset. We feel like they have reset. We're back on a normal deployment cycle. But, you know, our job is to find a couple companies that we believe could be great billion dollar companies with founders we believe could lead them there a year each. 
uh, and do that. And I think you know we've been excited of what we saw probably um, in the fourth quarter of last year in terms of expectations being reset. You know, there's a whole group of founders who had golden handcuffs from uh, that time that, that have faded away as public stock prices have have dropped, and therefore you know they couldn't leave. Google or, or Snap or whatever it was because they leave all this option money on the table, but they really want to start a company. And now as that, as that embedded golden handcuff has disappeared, you know, they feel more free to go out and, and start a business and they're excited to do it. So I think this is going to be similar to 08 or 09 or when I was an entrepreneur in, 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 20, in 2000, 2001. It's a great time to start a business. There's more people who want to do it. You know, there's going to be a better way to aggregate talent um, as the, you know, the, you're, you're seeing um, more layoffs and less, less uh, irrational pricing on, on hiring. And, you know, and there's a sense, of, uh, a sense of thrift out there in the market um, that people might have gone away from in the last couple of years. And uh, we think that you know, having a culture of thrift is, is a core part of any startups, right. startups DNA. Yeah, last one here. Um, you know, when you think about um, just again, you know, we had that 2008, 2009, this kind of confluence of events as mobile, social, broadband, that sort of yes. thing. What, what, what excites you guys at First Mark right now? What do you guys see as something 10 years from now we're going to be talking about, which was really a sea change for technology? And again, I think, you know, a lot of us have been looking at this chat GPT yes. and some of these language models and, and some of these AI applications for a whole host of different industries. I'm just curious, like, what, what do you guys focus on? Because they sound like buzz words right now, yeah. but some of them are going to be the next unicorns. Yeah, so I, I think that's, I think you're right. Um, so, you know, on, on the consumer side, you know, we've seen, um, you know, there, there tends to be a platform shift. And, and one of the things that was interesting, you know, building businesses 20, 25 years ago was, you know, the growing installed base of broadband. And what, what, what was broadband going to do to enable a next generation of applications, um, uh, 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 via the internet, and then you know, in that downturn was also a confluence of the iPhone. And what is uh, what is a smartphone by having a computer in your pocket enable you to do? And that ushered in a whole next generation of companies. Uh, we haven't seen a real platform transition or something that we've, we've seen great disruption on the consumer side. But what we have seen is vertical, very very large verticals being disrupted, which, are, which is fascinating. So on the consumer side, I'm going to say you know, healthcare, biggest part of our GDP, uh, has not been disrupted digitally yet, but we believe that um, a whole bunch, whole areas of healthcare are going to be disrupted by having a more digital first, more bespoke experience uh, with companies like Roman Health that are, that are leading the way of how to create a higher quality, more personalized, more value focused um, healthcare uh, by having a doctor in your pocket. On the, flip, on the other side, on the enterprise side, I think you're right. The, the AI is really something to be excited about. You know, they're horizontal platforms of, you know, being able to do workflow, being able to have computers process things. There's vertical platforms like ChatGPT or, or Lenza that could do everything from, you know, turn you into uh, a space superhero from a selfie to, um, you know, write a term paper for you if you're in the seventh grade. I think that, that that's the toy, you know, element of it. But we're seeing things um, like uh, generative AI that's doing synthetic media creation. We're seeing elements even in, in verticals, you know, like healthcare of scanning bodies to be able to understand, you know, what happens in terms of cancer growth or even um, ca uh, cardiac calcium within within your heart. Uh, so that this AI, both horizontally and vertically, I think is something that we're probably underappreciating today, although it, it is getting uh, too much, maybe almost too much buzz now, but something that will be very, very large. All right, so that's a great question. I mean, does that make you a little nervous? Like, so we just went through this period again, we've been talking about due diligence now, you and I have been talking about it on CNBC and on our pod and, and, and venues like this for a while, and, and everyone knew that it was getting kind of lazy. It was that sort of environment over the last yeah. few years. You know, I think a lot of what just happened with this whole FTX situation was really kind of the explanation point on, on yep. the thing. 
but then you see a headline, and you just said you thought that like some of these um, you know language models, like, some of the stuff is getting yeah. a lot of hype. You know, I just saw a headline the other day that a company I can't speak to it. I don't know who the founders are, but the headline was character two ex Google guys who are working on a machine yes. learning thing are, are looking to raise two hundred fifty million dollars at a billion dollar valuation for a company they just started. So I'm yep. my, my, and like how can it be that? And I'm not saying these guys may be the, may be the next Google for all I know. But yeah. what I'm saying is. How can it be that, that that much capital can be thrown at something that we just don't know about yet? Well, I mean, we, we talked on a broad basis of these macro uh, bubbles and, and, and bubbles bursting. And then, but there's always small bubbles bursting. Yeah. And there's always, there's always things that are overly inflated, overly hyped. I think you know, tech on the whole, especially Silicon Valley, has their own echo chamber and bubble factor. Uh, I th so I think generative AI might be might be having its moment for better or worse now, uh, but I think the why diligence matters is because you know you're, we're not trying to play a sector bet on AI and we're AI thematic. It's you know hey there's AI which which is something really interesting and something that might be transformative, but we really like this AI company who's able to detect cancer. This AI company who's able to process fields and formats at 1% at a, at of the cost of, of a human being. There's AI out there doing real jobs that have real customers. Those customers are diligenceable. They're driving real ROI. They're sharing that ROI. And if you could find, and, they, and the team's great, so if you could find those entrepreneurs, you could diligence that model, you're able to, you're able to pick your, yeah. your, your individual companies in, in what might be a bubble. Yeah, what, what might be a bubble? Um, again, uh, one last thing, I guess, uh, we'll just focus on this, is that you know, you being in New York, we started this conversation close to Wall Street, close yes. to, you know, when you think about, again, at some point, you know, we've seen the US dollar come in, we've seen interest rates, at least the 10 year US Treasury come in, we've seen inflation inputs come in, we've seen high yield credit kind of hold up, you know? Um, a lot of measures that I would look at and say, you know, is the equity market, at least public, is it safe to get Get back in the water, they're at least kind of telling you in, 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 a, in a relatively stable macro environment that we're probably not that far away. Okay. Yes. So I'm curious, um, you know, for you, we just talked about you have this capital, you have this dry powder. Um, what are some signs that you might take from the public markets that would give you greater confidence in deploying this capital sooner than later? Um, probably the number one sign is the reopening of the IPO market. Yeah. So, um, you know, nothing gives you more confidence in deploy capital than having proof that your prior capital you deployed was smart. Um, and therefore, you know, a reopening of an IPO market, we, we probably have a dozen companies that, you know, are hoping to go public in the next 18 to 24 months, assuming the market opens around Labor Day, which is conventional wisdom at this point. Um, so having that reopen and having a healthy IPO market after what's been, I think, the second worst IPO market ever over the last uh, 15 months. Uh, and then, we, then the second piece would be, you know, what is, what does a reinflation or even just a normalization of the market mean for M and A? So you're seeing some of this, some M and A deals get done, but uh, in general. You know the the large companies who are going to be the buyers in this situation have said, "Hey, we just laid off a whole lot of people. Um, our our investors are telling us we should be risk off. You know, how, you know, how are we going to buy a company for a billion dollars if you know we just laid off a whole bunch of people or risk off? Should we change that up? Um, so you know, a stabilization of the market." Will, will kind of start to reopen the M&A markets, a long-term stabilization will open the uh, IPO markets, and therefore there'll be a much healthier movement of capital in and out of, of venture funds in the privates. All right, well, cool. Our time is up here. We really appreciate you guys being here. Rick Heitzman, First Mark Capital, thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you very guys. much. Thank you, guys. <laughs>